Next, we'll explore the st underscore mode field of the stat structure. It contains some really important information about the file. These bottom nine bits are the familiar read, write and execute permissions for the file's owner, group and the rest of the world. And I'm assuming that you're familiar with these. Incidentally, if you've ever wondered why the command for changing the permissions on a file is called chmod, here's why. It's short for change mode and it changes the mode field of the inode. Next we have the so-called sticky bit shown here as a T. Applied to a directory, it modifies the rules about who can delete files from the directory. And historically, it had an important and quite different role when it was applied to an ordinary file. But on Linux, the sticky bit is ignored on ordinary files. The next two bits, the set GID and set UID bits, are the heart of the privilege escalation mechanism in Linux. They tell an executable program that it should run with the effective permissions of its group and its owner, respectively. I'll revisit those in the module about access control and identity, though I'm kind of hoping that you've already seen these before. In truth, it's tempting to deliver an entire Linux system administration lecture based around this one slide, but I resist because our focus is on systems programming, not systems administration. These final four bits specify the type of the file. Now there was a saying that in Unix everything looks like a file and there's still truth in that because not everything you will find in the file system is a file in the traditional sense. For example, we have named pipes. I'll talk about those in lesson five and they have entries in the file system. So too do the block devices that correspond to disk partitions and the like and the character devices such as terminals or TTYs in Linux parlance. But the three types of file that are really important to us here are the directories, the regular files and the symbolic links. Anyway, just remember that it's these top four bits of the mode that specify the file type. Now, there are some useful macros that help us access the various bit positions in the file mode in our code. There are symbolic constants representing the individual bits for these bottom 12, with rather nasty names that are hard to type and completely impossible to pronounce. Uh, typically, you'd use them in a bitwise AND like this, where we're testing to see if a file is world writable. Then there are macros for testing the file type. These do the bitwise AND for you, so that you can use them directly in an IF like this, where we're testing to see if something is a regular file. If all this looks complicated, my advice is don't panic. It's just detail, not complexity, that you need to master here. Let's put all this into practice with a little program that lists a file's type and its permissions, as well as the timestamps that we saw earlier. Rather unimaginatively, it's called list file. Some of it will look familiar from the showtimes program we examined before. For example, we begin by allocating a stat structure. In this case, we take our file name from the command line rather than hardwiring it into the code. Then we do a stat on the file, and this time we actually test for errors. Now comes the tricksy stuff as we print out the file type. That's this line of code here. Now you remember that the file type is encoded in the mode field up near the top end. If we take this and we shift it right by 12 bits and, just to be certain, mask off everything except the bottom four bits, we'll end up with a number between 0 and 15. We use that to index into an array of strings that's defined up here that specify the type of the file and we pluck out the appropriate file type description which we're printing out here using printf.
Now, some of you may be shaking your head sadly at this line of code and thinking you'll go back to writing COBOL, maybe. But maybe a few of you will, like me, revel in the economy of expression in this one line of code. If you really don't like this technique, you're free to use a chain of if-else statements to identify and print the file's type. Now, scrolling down, this next bit isn't clever, it's just tedious. We tried to print out the file's permissions using a traditional RWX string, like the one you would get from an ls-l. Here, we build a string character by character using printf. Each character is one of R, W or X if the permission is on, or a hyphen if the permission is off. And you'll see that we're using C's famous question mark colon operator to select the appropriate symbol for each of the nine character positions. And you'll see here use of those bit mask macros that I showed you earlier. Finally, we print the timestamps, as I showed you before. So now we'll build the program. And we'll run it, perhaps rather incestuously, to examine its own source code. You'll see that it correctly identifies it as a regular file. Let's compare the permissions that it's showing us with those shown by ls-l. And they agree. Notice that ls-l is showing us the last modification timestamp, that's this one here, by default. Let's try a list file on something else. You'll see there that slash etc is correctly identified as a directory. And slash dev slash tty is correctly identified as a character device. So far, so good. 